You're sure to fall in love. You're sure to fall in love with old Cave. Hi, uh, welcome to a celebration of Nantucket Sound, our monthly webinar series, and thanks for joining us. I'm Audra Parker, I'm the President and CEO of the Alliance to Protect Nantucket Sound. And for those of you who don't know us, we are a nonprofit environmental organization dedicated to the long-term protection and preservation of Nantucket Sound. We were formed in 2002 and we are based in Hyannis on Cape Cod. And with this educational series, we hope to provide you with an in-depth view of the sound's many extraordinary values um, and support for our mission to permanently protect the special, special body of water. And this is critical, as you can see from the map that was just up a second ago. Um, you have a very unique situation in Nantucket Sound where you have federal waters that are unprotected surrounded by a ring of state waters that extend three miles from the shorelines that are protected under the Massachusetts Ocean Sanctuaries Act. So in addition to uh, these types of threat and vulnerability, the sound is also facing other environmental threats such as diminished water quality, algae blooms, coastal erosion, habitat degradation, you know, depletions in fish stocks. So the Alliance has been working on trying to get federal legislation enacted called the Nantucket Sound National Historic Landmark Act. And this federal bill would do three things. First, it would designate Nantucket Sound as a National Historic Landmark, which is the highest level of historic protection possible and is consistent with designations. For example, the entire island of Nantucket is a National Historic Landmark. The Kennedy Compound in Hyannisport on the Cape is a National Historic Landmark, as is Wesleyan Grove on the Vineyard. So it would designate the sound, tying that all together and designate it as a National Historic Landmark. It would also ensure that the protections that I mentioned that apply to the state waters of Nantucket Sound were consistent and would also apply to the federal waters in the center. And finally, the bill would provide a whole host of significant environmental benefits addressing threats to water quality, habitat degradation, coastal erosion, and, and other threats. So, this bill has uh, widespread support. We have about 80 stakeholder groups on board that support it. And these include towns on Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard and Cape Cod, tribal government, environmental organizations, historic preservation groups, renewable energy developers, chambers of commerce and, and many others. So that is the introduction just to give you a sense of what the Alliance is working on. And again, this educational series aims to give you a better appreciation or more in-depth appreciation of uh, many of the values of the sound. So tonight we have Seth Engelborg with us and he is the naturalist educator and program manager at the Linda Loring Nature Foundation on Nantucket. Seth develops and implements environmental education programs for audiences of all ages and backgrounds. And he also leads the organization's birding field trips and coordinates research on the Linda Loring Nature Foundation's 275 acre property. So for this webinar, we're very excited to um, welcome Seth and hear what he has to say about birds on Nantucket Sound. So um, your video capacity is off, you'll only be able to see me and Seth, but we'll take your questions throughout just using the Q&A function or you can wait till the end. So welcome Seth and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Audra. I'm gonna go ahead and just share my screen. That's great. And I will get off and I'll rejoin you at the end for questions. Hello, everybody. My name is Seth Engelborg. I'm the Naturalist Educator and Program Manager at the Linda Lauren Nature Foundation. First of all, I'd like to start by thanking Audra, um, thanking the Alliance to Protect Nantucket Sound for inviting me to this webinar series, a celebration of Nantucket Sound. And today I'm gonna to be talking about the birds of Nantucket Sound. So they already showed probably a better map than I have, but 
just for those of you who aren't on the Cape or Islands. Nantucket Sound is this water body that um, is south of the south end of Cape Cod and north of the North Shore of Nantucket. We'll delve into the birds that we can find there in a little bit. But before we go too far deeper, I just want to talk a little bit more about what we do at the Linda Loring Nature Foundation um, and what my role is there as well. So the Linda Loring Nature Foundation is a 275-acre um, property on Nantucket. We operate as a wildlife sanctuary and a land trust. Our property is located on the northwest end of the island, for those of you who have not been here before. And our mission is to connect people of all ages to nature through environmental education and through research. Just a few more maps. Um, so again, we're located on the northwest end of the island. We're technically not a coastal landowner. Um, our property is in the upland and wetlands bordering the north head of Long Pond. But just off the map to the right, if you look to the top, you can see the beach. And beyond that beach um, is Nantucket Sound. So although we don't necessarily have lands right up against the ocean, our coastal uh, property. We do have a view um, of Nantucket Sound from our property and we you know, are experiencing the impacts of Nantucket Sound as well. So again, we're 275 acres. Uh, this pink line is our current trail system. The yellow line is our property boundary. Um, and we operate as a wildlife sanctuary. We became operational in 2007. Um, so we're a little bit newer on the scene, but the uh, main tenets of our organization are these three things, research, education, and stewardship. And because of the focus of today's talk being about birds, I'm gonna quickly highlight some of the bird-related research, bird-related education, and bird-related stewardship that we do at the property. So for bird research, two of the most um, active ongoing um, studies we have right now are a nest box monitoring study. We have these nest box set up, nest boxes set up all throughout our property. There are about 40 of them in total. Um, and what we're trying to do with those is examine long-term population trends in cavity nesting birds and how they might be responding um, interannually to different changes and also how they might be re reacting on a larger scale to impacts uh, such as impacts from climate change. So there are several cavity nesting birds that may use these boxes, but the ones that we primarily find and that we're most uh, interested in are tree swallows. Here's a tree swallow nest. These are tree swallow fledglings at that stage. And what we do is in the summer, uh, we have a weekly monitoring program where we go to each box, check to see if there's eggs, chicks, fledglings, what activity is happening, and record that. So we have two years of formal monitoring on these boxes and a, vari um, a variety of years of kind of informal monitoring before that. And we're going to be continuing this, this monitoring program for many years in the future, trying to see if there's changes in this nest success over time, and if impacts like climate change are um, causing a difference at our property. The tree swallow especially is a species that's unfortunately already in decline and is projected to be in steeper decline uh, due to climate change. Another pro program we're doing is avian response to grassland restoration. Actually, it's part of a larger project. We received grant funding through a funder called the Robert F. Schumann Foundation that's really focused on uh, land management and um, how birds are responding to land management. So what we did is we identified areas on our property where there was a non-native invasive tree, the Japanese black pine, and we went and cut and removed all of that material from specific locations. But prior to doing that, 
we did two things. Actually, we did three things. We monitored the vegetation in the areas that were gonna be cut. We monitored the birds in the areas that were gonna be cut. And we did a drone aerial survey of all the areas. We also have a control plot um, where we're monitoring those same things, but the trees are still there and won't be cut for the remainder of the project. So on the bird end of things, what we're doing is called a point count. It's a standard protocol in the avian ecology world. Especially, essentially, you're just going to establish uh, GPS locations and you're counting all of the birds that you see or hear within a defined time within that circle. Uh, so we did that prior to management, uh, four times prior to management. And then we did that this year after the management, the trees were cut um, this winter, this past winter. So then we did the, the, post the post management monitoring this summer. And what we're trying to see is if the bird species assemblage has changed before the man from before the management to after the management. And we're also gonna be doing the same protocol for two more years, um, the next two years following this, to try to see um, any effects as to whether, as the vegetation is changing, so primarily it had been these non-native invasive pines, and now it's reverted back to more of a native grassland and heathland ecosystem due to that canopy being open. What we're trying to see is if the, the vegetation will match the birds that are expected to be in that vegetation. So we're looking to see if more grassland dependent birds show up. And in particular, we're looking for 24 species of, of conservation concern that have by, been identified by the state of Massachusetts as being reliant on grasslands. Uh, we have other projects as well, but those are our two most active ones right now at the foundation. And in bird education, uh, one of the major things we do is weekly birding field trips um, in, the, in the summer, or really it's from the spring to the fall. We take groups of people out to various locations on Nantucket Island, and we uh, help them find birds, help them identify birds, um, show them the resources to go birding themselves, and just generally have a, a good time trying to look for birds. We also, uh, that, that program has been um, going on really since the inception of the foundation, even before I started in 2016, but I've been leading those trips for about five years now. We also do a variety of kids programming, uh, school programs, school programs, summer programs, uh, after school programs, enrichment opportunities. I um, mean, in, in some of these programs, we talk about birds and the impact of and the impact of birds on the local ecosystems. For instance, in this program, we're discussing osprey and how osprey build their nest. And what we did with the kids is we created a fake or a mock osprey pole and had them learn how to create an osprey nest. And then we put some wooden eggs and a stuffed animal osprey in the nest so they could understand how the nesting process works. We also do some stewardship that is related to birds. Uh, one of the things that we've done at the property is put up a, a series of osprey nest poles. We currently have three on our property. If you look at the logo of the Linda Loring Nature Foundation, um, that osprey pole and the osprey itself is featured prominently. So it's important to provide habitat for these birds or provide nest sites for these birds. I wouldn't say it's like we do a whole lot of rigorous monitoring of osprey, but we're providing them uh, opportunities to use our property uh, through nesting platforms and our property tends to be in a good site for them because there's ample fishing opportunities in the adjacent north head of Long Pond and also in the uh, Nantucket Sound right across the street. Uh, this, these photos on the right here are actually the uh, before and after photos of the Schumann Grant project that I was talking about. So this is more of a rigorous 
uh, land management type of stewardship where we are removing non-native invasive species, opening up um, the canopy. And then this is in the winter, but I didn't add the photo in where it's in the next summer where you can see that the, the native grassland has grown back and that grassland will provide food, cover, and nesting availability for grassland species. So with that, I'll get a little bit into Nantucket Sound and the birds that inhabit Nantucket Sound. So Nantucket Sound is really this meeting point. It's this really interesting um, kind of point where northern species ranges and southern species ranges meet. So on Nantucket Island and in the Sound as well, we're at the very absolute maximum edge of the range, the northern edge of the range for some species, and at the absolute southern edge of the range for other species. So this bird on the left is a Barrow's golden eye. It's a um, winter sea duck that just barely gets down in the non-breeding um, time of the year, the winter, to Nantucket Sound, uh, a little bit of Cape Cod Bay, maybe Long Island Sound a little bit, but doesn't go south of there. Um, this bird tends to spend the majority of its time further north, and it also exists on the west coast of the United States, which isn't on this map, but really this is a, a more northerly species that just barely reaching Nantucket Sound in the winter. We also have other species that are kind of more subtropical or even tropical species, like this snowy egret, that is really primarily spending uh, most of its time in Central America, South America, the, the uh, Southern United States, and has just started in the last few decades to expand its range north and reach up until Nantucket and Nantucket Sound. So snowy egrets, really only started breeding on Nantucket itself within the last two to three decades. Um, that may be a climate impact, that may just be a rain shift, but really we're at the edge of the range for that species. So we're kind of at this unique location where we can get the best of both worlds. Uh, the Southern species that you typically would have to go somewhere else to find and these Northern species that you would typically have to go somewhere else to find. We can find them both in the same location. So what does Nantucket Sound actually provide for birds? So the biggest thing it provides is ample food opportunities. If there's any anglers on the call, you may know that it's sometimes of the year, there are huge uh, rushes of bait into Nantucket Sound, which brings game fish and things that anglers like to pursue, but also it's critical resource for a variety of birds, especially uh, piscivorous birds like this tern, who's eating a, I think this is a sand lance there. Yeah, I think it's a sand lance. And it really, Nantucket sand, Sound is a really productive bait fish source, which provides uh, ample foraging and hunting opportunities for a variety of uh, water birds. It also provides cover. In this picture, it might just look like these ducks are out in the open on this, this water body, but really um, ducks and other water birds, they spend a majority of their time doing something that's called rafting. They're basically just floating and not expending any energy while on the water surface and large, Large semi protected uh, water bodies like Nantucket Sound are a really good cover place for these birds. If they were out in the open Atlantic, let's say, with a lot of wave action and uh, predation pressure, it's harder to um, just raft without expending energy. But in these places like harbors and sounds and bays, they can have a little bit better cover. The land surrounding the sound that the Cape and Islands, uh, the beaches and the pond edges and things like that also provide excellent nest sites, 
uh, water resources and additional food resources for a variety of birds who are in the sound area. So let's talk for a second about migration and seasonality. So this graphic on the right here is the bird migration forecast for tonight, September 30th, 2021. And if you look at the color coding and you look up to where um, Cape Cod and Nantucket and the vineyard are, you can see they're kind of this orange yellow color. That indicates that there's gonna be a medium to high migratory uh, flight of birds tonight. And if you look at other places in the country, like the Pacific Northwest, the Southwest, there's not as much of an activity, but a lot of the Eastern shoreline, um, you can look down in the, in the Mid-Atlantic like the Chesapeake Bay area is showing a very high migration. And it's all part of um, what I'm gonna show next. But before I get to that, I just wanna point out a few things. So on Nantucket, Nantucket Sound, but Nantucket Island especially, our fall migration can, uh, tends to be very consistent and very steady across years. Our spring migration is more sporadic. Uh, some years we have a really excellent push of migratory birds in the spring, and some years we have almost none. It really depends on the, the winds and the weather we're getting. But in the fall, there are good years and bad years, but it tends to be uh, more, more consistent on an annual basis. And how the, my, how the fall migrations work, it comes in three separate stages. We call these fall migrations, but actually some of them start in the summer. So the first thing we start to see is the shorebird migration. And that actually starts in late July, early August, um, which to us seems like the middle of the summer. But the shorebirds who have already finished their breeding uh, season and need to migrate down to Central or South America, it's time for them to go. So we get shorebirds um, July and August and into September. And then we start to get songbirds um, right around this time is a great migratory time for songbirds. And then it's just starting or maybe we'll be better in October and November. The last thing we get is waterfowl, uh, ducks and mergansers and sea ducks and things like that, who bred elsewhere and are coming to Nantucket or potentially to Nantucket Sound to winter. So they were the stopping point of their migration. They're um, gonna end their migration here and spend from the fall all the way until next spring, let's say April or May, before they migrate back to their breeding grounds. Um, just for reference, on Nantucket Island, in the summer season, there is very few ducks that can be observed. Uh, realistically, there's only two duck species that can be observed on a daily basis. There's a few other that you can look for and find, um, you know, maybe three, three or four or five if you really try hard, but just a handful of ducks that can be observed. In contrast, in the winter season, we have 30 different species of ducks and sea ducks that you can find. Um, so we get this huge influx of different species and also of lots of individuals. Some of these ducks come in very large numbers, which I'll talk about in a bit. But why is this migration pat pattern happening? It's something called the Atlantic Flyway. So there are two maps here. The map in the center shows the migratory passage of the Atlantic Flyway. And then the map on the right with the red circle where Nantucket Sound is highlighted is the states involved in the Atlantic Flyway. And the birds featured here, the bird on the top is a common tern. That's a species that is really dependent on this flyway. And also this bird on the bottom is the red knot. That's a species that is becoming rare and rare um, and is threatened and endangered in some states. And it, it relies on the stopping points along the, the Atlantic Flyway to find critical food resources to refuel and be able to complete the rest of its journey um, south. So 
Nantucket Sound, Nantucket Island especially, is a critical stopping point. Some these birds, uh, some of them, they breed up in the high Arctic or uh, uh, Canadian Maritimes, or even just in like coastal Maine, or they might have bred on Nantucket itself. The common tern uh, breeds here, least terns breed here, but they're gonna wanna eat as much food um, and get as much resources as possible so they can make that flight. They're gonna try to do it in as little time as possible because migration is very risky. There are storms offshore, uh, there's predation, the birds are tired. So they're gonna try to do it quickly, um, but they need to have the resources for it. So they are gonna stop. Some of these birds tend to stop more than others, but they're gonna stop at these critical points for a relatively short amount of time, basically just to fuel up on whatever food they're eating and then continue their journey south. So we also, apart from migration, have really productive breeding grounds all around Nantucket Sound. So the sound itself is bordered on all sides by a lot of sandy beaches, the south shore of Cape Cod, uh, the north shore of Nantucket, the eastern end of uh, the vineyard. And these places tend to be extremely productive habitats and breeding grounds for shorebirds, particularly for endangered and threatened species like the roseate tern on the left and the piping plover here on the right. A roseate tern is an endangered species, uh, one of the most productive places for roseate terns anywhere in the country is Monomoy Island off Chatham. That's kind of right in Nantucket Sound. Also, Muskegon Island is sometimes a very productive um, roseate tern nesting site, also within Nantucket Sound. And then piping plover, um, Nant Nantucket itself is a very good breeding site for piping plover. I don't really know the numbers as much um, from the Cape, but I know from the work that Mass Audubon's Coastal Waterbird Program does, there are a variety of important nesting sites for piping plover on the Cape as well. And these birds, you know, are really special parts of our ecosystem and are at severe risk for um, becoming further endangered or potentially extinct. These birds face, face a lot of pressures. They face development pressure. They face um, um, recreational pressure sometimes uh, where use of beaches for recreational activities like driving or dog walking might harm these birds. And they also are going, going to be facing climate change pressure. So having uh, these birds protected and observed and monitored in Nantucket Sound will be crucial for continuing the success of their populations moving forward. And things like terns especially are piscivorous birds. Piscivorous means that they eat fish. So these birds are really benefiting, benefiting from the productive amount of fish that exists within the sound. We also have extremely productive wintering grounds. I mentioned this a bit, a bit before, but Nantucket Sound, as well as some of the offshore locations and places like Cape Cod Bay are some of the most productive winter habitats for waterfowl anywhere on the East Coast of North America. Uh, we have huge populations of some species um, and we have other species that really aren't found elsewhere but can be found in Nantucket Sound. And the last thing we have is world-class birding opportunities. So we have everything that runs the gamut, kind of from these offshore opportunities on the left to see shear waters or uh, banding opportunities to see migratory birds like vireos, or just to go out like I'm doing in the middle here with your binoculars and a scope, and or a scope, I should say and to find whatever's there. The, the thing that's so interesting about being in a migratory location like Nantucket is the birds change throughout the year. Um, you can go birding in the same location in July 
And then again in December, and you'll see completely different species at the same, same spot. So with that, I'm gonna get to just delve a little bit deeper into some of the birds you actually can find here. And I'm gonna just highlight really um, more of the water oriented birds uh, because this, this talk is about Nantucket Sound. So we have a few classes of birds. The first thing I'm gonna talk about are seabirds. Uh, this picture on the top left is a razor bill. And the picture on the right is a dovekey or a little auk. These are two species that belong to the auk family. And these are really kind of more of alpine species. They breed up in the high Arctic and they come down here in, in the winter. Um, so you really only find those in the, uh, the winter season here. And then we have things like this bird on the top right is a parasitic Jaeger. That's a bird that um, spends pretty much its entire life at sea. Um, so if you're in a boat or the ferry between Nantucket and Hyannis, sometimes you might be able to see that. And you also might be able to see this bird on the left, the uh, great, great Shearwater, which is another bird that is here in the summer, but it, it doesn't generally come too close to the shore. It spends most of its time out on the, the open water. The seabirds, they really only come onto land to breed. Um, the rest of their life, they're either flying or rafting on the water surface itself. Then we have things that are classified more as water birds. These are birds that are reliant on water for some resource, but they don't spend their entire life on water. They spend a lot of their life on land as well. So the top left bird is a double crested cormorant. Um, that's a bird that eats fish. It dives down under the water surface to catch fish, but then it spends the rest of its day um, kind of drying out on land. The reason you often see cormorants like this with their wings held out is because unlike many birds, unlike most birds really, whose feathers are waterproof, cormorants' feathers are not waterproof. And the reason why they're not waterproof is because if they were waterproof, that bird would be too buoyant to dive down and catch the fish where they're at. So a double-crested cormorant can dive up to about 30 feet. Um, and in order to do that, it needs to actually soak up water into its feathers to create ballast weight to help it dive down, to be able to reach a depth that the fish are at. If it, if it had waterproof feathers, it would have a very difficult time. It would struggle trying to get to the depth that it needed to. So over time, this bird has adapted to have non-waterproof feathers, even though most birds across all taxa tend to have waterproof feathers. And that's why you see it during this, this display. We also have things like seagulls. This is the great black bat gull. It's the largest gull species in the world. You might know it from one of them trying to eat your sandwich at the beach. But <laughs> apart from that minor issue, uh, Nantucket and the and Cape Cod and the areas around Nantucket Sound are one of the most productive breeding grounds for um, great black bat gull in New England. And then we also have other birds like this common loon that people attend, tend to associate with other places. Loons are associated with New Hampshire or Maine. But in the winter, these actually come down to waters off Nantucket um, and they spend their winter here. Then we have ducks. We have both inland like freshwater ducks and sea ducks, but I'm gonna highlight all sea ducks here because Nantucket Sound is a uh, obviously a body of water that is, is salt water. So we have on the top left, uh, the long-tailed duck, Top right is greater scop. Um, top bottom left is a common eider. And the bottom right is a little bit of a different species. It's a red breasted merganser. Mergansers are um, closely related to ducks. Uh, some people might say they're separate, but they kind of make up part of the overall family of what we call waterfowl. Um, and this is just a small sampling of the species that can be found. As I said before, there's, there's 30 different species of, of duck that can be found here in the winter. 
And then we have shorebirds. So shorebirds, you know, don't spend most of their time on the water or in the water. They spend most of their time on land, but they benefit greatly from being in a productive um, water environment because everything about their life strategy is related to the water. So these birds, they nest right out on the beach, um, but they, they need to forage in the water's edge or in the water itself for their food. Um, and, and what we have here on the bottom left, it, this is a sanderling, middle is a, a greater yellow legs, and then at the bottom right is the American oyster catcher. That's a bird that um, unfortunately is experiencing some population declines, but Nantucket Island especially is one of the most productive places for oyster catcher anywhere in its range along the East Coast. They range from Massachusetts down to Florida and Nantucket Island tends to year after year be one of the highest nesting success, success sites for this bird. So those are some of the birds you might see on the water or the water shore. But what if you want to go out and bird yourself? So the, the easiest way to get started in birding Nantucket Sound is to use um, what's known as eBird. eBird is a citizen science app or website that was put out by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It's one of the oldest and um, most heavily used citizen science programs out of any program in the world. And the data is expansive really across every continent. Pretty much everywhere anyone has birded in the world, data has been submitted on eBird about that location. And the data does two very important things. The first thing it does is real researchers review this data and they, they analyze it um, and write scientific reports that are peer reviewed and published based off this data. The second thing it does is it serves as a community forum where people can share checklists um, and other people can see what birds have been reported recently in an area. So you might know when you go to somewhere, first of all, whether it's a good spot to go to at all. And if it is a good spot, what you might be looking for. Um, and one of the things that eBird does is create hotspots. These are locations that have a high number of species being reported and a high number of checklists being reported at that location. So this is the hotspot for Nantucket Sound. Um, so far in Nantucket Sound hotspot, 88 species have been reported across 65 checklists. That doesn't mean that only 88 species exist in Nantucket Sound. It just means that's what's been reported so far. Uh, other people also may have um, reported birds that aren't in the hotspot, but are in other personal locations near the hotspot. So it might not be showing all the species reported. But one of the things that eBird does is it creates bar charts Bar charts are this uh, photo on the left, and it shows you all the green bars of the month and the species for when that bird is actually found. So for instance, the first species on the list, the brant type of goose, is reported in January. It was reported here in November and December, but it wasn't reported in July. Um, so we, we know from viewing these bar charts that this is a species that's here in the winter, and not in the summer. And if anyone's interested, you can review these bar charts on this link at eBird and learn more. Uh, if you don't like digital resources, I guess you can use a good old fashioned book. So there's three books to get you started. Uh, the Birds of Massachusetts by Dick V and Wayne Peterson is general about birds across the whole state, but it will certainly have all the birds you might see in Nantucket Sound. Also, Birding Nantucket is focused on Nantucket Island more than Nantucket Sound, but it will be a great resource for um, birding in Nantucket Sound. That was put out by Ken Blackshaw and Edith Andrews. And if you don't really like um, carrying field guides around with you and you want just something small, you could use a waterproof pamphlet 
Uh, the one I'd recommend is the Birds of the New England Coast. You're not going to get a lot of information from it, just the picture and a general description. It's probably not going to have every bird, but it will have uh, the majority of the typical birds that you'll see, and uh, it will help you identify things in the field with a lightweight pamphlet. Um, so with that, I'm going to wrap up my presentation. I thank everybody very much for listening. Love to hear any thoughts or questions, and I will stop my screen share and, and we can uh, start the questions. Great, thank you, Seth. That was uh, very, very interesting. And I learned a lot from it. Um, I have a question from Cynthia that came in before the webinar that is asking you to speak a bit about long-tailed ducks, how long they spend in Nantucket waters, do they migrate? And is there a reason we haven't seen them in as much abundance in the last few years? Sure. So a lot of, long, a lot of parts. <laughs> so long-tailed ducks, um, they do migrate. They don't breed in Nantucket waters. They're one of the winter duck species that we have. Um, you might be able to see them as early as October, but tends to be more into November. And they'll stay uh, reliably through April or May. Sometimes a straggler might stay a little bit longer, but I would expect if you really want to look for them, the best times would be um, November through April. The reason why we have, haven't had so many of them in recent years is still a little bit unknown. Uh, I do know what Cynthia is talking about off the west end of Nantucket a few decades ago, or maybe maybe only one decade ago, it used to be pretty easy to see tens of thousands of these birds. Um, now we don't see as many. We see more like in the hundreds or low thousands. Still definitely a productive, uh, healthy population. Um, but some of that may, might be a rain shift. It might be a climate change impact, or there might be other, other reasons. But I would say overall, long-tailed ducks are still doing pretty well and have a healthy population status. Great, thank you. Um, Sandy asks, how exciting is the sighting of a gray heron? Sure, so uh, I would say it's super exciting. I wasn't the person who sighted the gray heron, but um, it was Skylar Cardell, who some people on this talk might know. Um, it's a bird that had only been seen in Nantucket County once ever. So in the birding world, we call that a mega rarity. I think a lot of people were very excited about that, but I never, I never saw it. Maybe one day. <laughs> um, is Nantucket a snowy owl location? Yes. So Nantucket tends to be a very productive location for snowy owls, but snowy owls are eruptive, eruptive with an I. It means in some years, their populations will extend very far south um, in large numbers. And in some years, they won't extend far south at all. They won't really leave their, um, with their breeding grounds up in the Arctic much at all. So on, in some years on Nantucket, we get a few birds, two or three. And in, in large eruptive years, we might have 30 plus birds sighted. So it kind of depends on the year, but I would say reliably every single year, at least one snowy owl is being sighted on Nantucket. Okay. Um, Mary asks, do piping plovers, is it plover or plover? Uh, depends That's my question. who you ask. And I think there's a little bit of a generational thing here too. I tend to notice that uh, older folks tend to say plover, younger tend to say plover, but it doesn't really matter. The, All right, well, I'm going to pretend I'm young and say plover then. So the question is, do piping plovers migrate? Um, uh, Mary's seeing a large amount this past week along the Nantucket Sound shoreline. Yes, they definitely migrate and they, def they do something else called staging, which is prior to migration, they um, start to kind of group up in bigger numbers in productive uh, sheltered foraging grounds. So the reason why you might be seeing a lot in the same place might be a staging event rather than rather than a migratory event. Okay. Um, Roberta is asking, are there any organized trips to locate water birds happening in the winter? 
Um, on Nantucket, we we don't really do a whole lot of organized trips at the foundation in the winter. Uh, our birding field trips end at the end of October, um, but we do offer like private birding experiences for people who are interested in that. And I'm not sure about Cape Cod. I, I don't not not very familiar with the birding opportunities on Cape Cod. But if you have additional questions about resources, you can get in touch with me, and we're always help. We're always happy to help people find the birds they want to see. Great. Um, what's the next question? Kathleen says. How is artificial man-made lights at night affecting migration in this area? There's a lot less artificial night lights on the Cape compared to Boston, but just wondering what the impact might be. Yeah, I'm not really an expert in that. I, I tend to know that artificial lighting does have um, detrimental impacts on migratory birds, um, especially in cities like New York City. There have been some die-off events of migratory warblers and things like that because of confusion of city lighting. But I think in general, places like Nantucket and Cape Cod tend to be pretty relatively minimal in artificial lighting. So that's, uh, that's good for the population of migratory birds. Right, that makes sense. Um... Sherry asks, what shorebirds are more acceptive to human environments? Do osprey come into our harbors? Yeah, so I would say at this point, pretty much every shorebird is well adapted to human influenced um, locations. I'll give you an example that's not really from Nantucket Sound, but we do have the same species here. The species is least tern. Um, and least tern, they also breed down in Florida. But in Florida, unfortunately, there's been a lot of development of beaches. There's not a ton of um, nesting sites available for them naturally on beaches. But they found that least terns have adapted and have started to breed on flat asphalt roofs in Florida. Over 50% of all the least terns breeding in Florida are breeding on asphalt roofs currently. So these birds are way smarter and way more resilient than you think, but they do need to be protected. Uh, piping plover nest, for instance, looks like a tiny little scrape in the ground. You, you can barely see it. And the eggs are a tiny little camouflaged um, egg that you, you won't see. And even the chicks are a little tiny ball, very camouflaged, white and, white and brown that you're not gonna see. So, we, when there are active nests, um, they, those beaches need to be closed off and protected so that those species can, can complete their breeding cycle. And the second part of her question, Seth, was do osprey come into our New England harbors? Yes, osprey definitely um, exist in New England harbors on Nantucket. There's quite a large population of osprey. Um, we've put up these artificial nest poles that I mentioned. I think there's 20 to 25 of them on the island. Osprey on the island also have started to re-nest uh, in natural sites, which are dead trees and snags. And I know um, at Dennis Yarmouth High School, there's an osprey pole right in the parking lot of the high school. And osprey nests there every single year even with tons of cars coming and going. So they're not really that, that uh, wary or um, influenced by human activity. Um, Roberta wants to know, is there a large population of barn owls on Nantucket? Yeah, so barn owls um, are species that I was gonna mention, but that's another species that we're at the absolute Northern edge of the range four of in Nantucket along the Eastern seaboard. So in the, in the Midwest, they get uh, to higher latitudes, but on the Atlantic coast, their, their range really ends right at Nantucket. Um, there is a population, there's a healthy population of barn owl, but really mainly because people have created artificial nest box sites for them to nest in. 
barn owl breed twice a year, once in the spring and then once again in the fall. What we've known is, or what we've seen is that the spring breeding cycle tends to be very productive. The weather is good, the food resources are good. The fall tends to be very risky and very unproductive um, because it tends to get too cold, uh, too fast for barn owl. And generally the barn owl chicks that um, hatch in the fall are much less likely to survive than the ones that hatch in the spring. You had, I had a question. Um, you had mentioned about the cormorants having um, with their wings so that they could dive down to catch fish. How, like how big are the fish that they're catching? Because I was thinking if it's difficult for them to get down, like how hard is it for them to get back up again if they're carrying a, a fish? Yeah, I mean, they catch pretty big fish. I mean, we're not talking about like, like a game fish sized striped bass. We're talking about like smaller bay fish type things, but um, you know, I've seen cormorants with foot long fish before, definitely. Um, there is an interesting link between cormorants and barn owls as well, is that barn owls are also a species that doesn't have waterproof feathers, but for a completely different reason. Their reason is so that they could adapt to have completely silent flight. So um, the barn owls, when they fly, the level of noise being created is 0.0, .0 decibels, completely silent. But the only way they can do that is to not have waterproof, waterproofing on their feathers. What the waterproofing really is, is the oil that most birds have in a preen gland located at their back. And they preen this oil along the feathers, but in flight, it, it tends to very slightly vibrate but it does make a sound. So barn owls don't have that, that oil, don't have that gland, so they can have waterproof, uh, so they can have um, silent flight, sorry. But it comes with a disadvantage. If we get a tropical storm and there's rain for like four or five days, the barn owls are unable to hunt for that entire period of time because they have to stay in a sheltered location. So they may end up starving in uh, extreme weather events. How long can they go without eating? Not, probably, probably barely five days. And I, I, they're probably at five days really struggling at that point. Huh, okay. Um, Robert asks, what do the snowy owls feed on? Yeah, so in their breeding grounds, snowy owls feed primarily on lemmings. Um, if you were a child in my age group, you might know lemmings as a, as a computer game, but what a, what a lemming actually is, is like a small mammal, like a mouse. Uh, they eat about 13 of those per day per owl. So they eat quite a bit of lemmings. But in the, in the winter, there are no lemmings here on Nantucket or in the Cape. They still do eat small mammals like mice, moles, voles, and shrews but they also take advantage of the location that, that they're at being primarily found on open uh, outlying beaches and outlying coastal dune systems and things like that. So they'll also uh, hunt gulls and shorebirds and small ducks and things like that. Okay. Um, from Sarah, are pelagic birds often in the sound or is that the exception compared to the numbers a few miles offshore to the east? Yeah, so pelagic birds are a large, um, it's a large group. There are birds that really um, basically never get close to land. Things like tropic birds and uh, boobies and skuas and things like that. Some of these can only be found closer to land in places like Nantucket Sound. Um, if we have a weather event, like a hurricane or a storm that are push, pushing birds to a specific location. But we can find a lot of seabirds still, uh, things like shearwaters and um, Jaegers um, and uh, storm petrels that might be, might be easier to find closer to land. So you, you had shown that there were, I think, 88 uh, species that were reported on eBird, but how many, how many do you think there really are? 
Do you think that captures most of them? No, I would say it's more than that. I mean, on Nantucket, uh, the island, there's about 350 species, maybe even more than that, that could be seen. But that includes a lot of the land birds like uh, warblers and cardinals and songbirds and things like that. But I would say even just with ducks and seabirds and shorebirds, you're well over hundred species that could be, could be found, probably, probably more than that. Great. Um... Let me see what else I have here. Oh, what are the biggest changes you've seen to the bird population around Nantucket Sound? Um, I'll, I'll admit I've only lived uh, on Nantucket Island since 2014 and only full time since 2016. So I haven't seen maybe the long term changes that others might have seen. I know things have been discussed about changes in um, long-tailed duck populations and things like that. One of the things that we are noticing from the last couple of years, I mentioned this uh, with the research we do, the, one of the species that we monitor is the tree swallow. The tree swallow on Nantucket typically has a huge migration event every October where tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of tree swallows will come um, and murmurate and spend a couple of weeks uh, on Nantucket before they migrate south. We haven't seen that in the last two or three years. It's been much lower numbers, but the birds are still breeding here, but we don't see the large migratory groups coming through in the fall anymore. Okay, and we're getting um, close to the hour, so I'll, I'll uh, wrap up with one final question for you, which is what's been your most unique or surprising discovery in your four or five years there? Bird discovery? Yeah, well, I guess. <laughs> um, I guess you could say something else, but yeah, I was thinking birds. I, there, there, are, there are quite a few, definitely. Um, I am really impressed by the varied thrush that was here on Nantucket a few years ago. It's, it's an interesting species. It's like the robin of the West Coast. I previously lived in uh, Washington State and Oregon for a little while doing Bird, bird work there. And this was a very easy species to see, but it really doesn't go east of the Rockies typically. So to see one on Nantucket was very unexpected, but for people who might be joining from the West Coast, it's probably in every single person's yard out there. Great. Well, Seth, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. I learned a lot more about birds than I knew coming in, and I'm sure our audience did as well. So we really appreciate you joining us tonight. Yeah, I appreciate it as well. And if anybody has additional questions that didn't get answered, feel free to email me directly. You can go to the Linda Loring Nature Foundation website, um, and you can find my contact information on there. And we're always happy to answer questions um, about birding, whether it be on Nantucket or elsewhere, or just about the ecology of Nantucket or Nantucket Sound in general. Great, well, thank you. And uh, thank you to our audience for joining us. I hope you have a deeper appreciation for Nantucket Sound, why it's so important and um, why legislation to protect this special place is critical. So if, if you have any questions about birds, as Seth said, please feel free feel free to contact him. If you have questions about our legislation or our work here at the Alliance, um, please feel free to contact us. And our next, um, hold on one sec. So you can reach me at audra at saveoursound.org. And our next webinar will be a look at marine mammals. And that will be featuring um, Regina Asmuda Silvia, who's the executive director of the Whale and Dolphin Conservation of North America. Um, so you can register on our website, which is saveoursound.org. And um, we hope you'll help support our mission. Go to our website, take action, and um, urge your le legislators to support the Nantucket Sound National Historic Landmark Act um, or donate at saveoursound.org. So again, thank you. And we hope to see you uh, next month. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice night. You too.